people giving me this opportunity to pull together some ideas on this hugely fascinating and hugely important subject of violence and the sacred. Um, my general thesis in these four lectures is that we will come to be better reconciled if we can manage to gain a sharper and more joined up understanding of how human violence is linked to the sacred. Now, if I'd advanced this proposal before the attack in 2001 on the Twin Towers in New York, the event known as 9-11, my guess is that it would have risked appearing eccentric. Few people really thought there was anything worth mentioning between human violence and the sacred, whatever that might be. It's certainly true that the word itself has virtually dropped out of academic anthropology in our own time, having been one of the key words of that discipline in its glory days during the first half of the 20th century. Books on terrorism do still sometimes invoke the sacred, but without being very sure of how or when it should be used. Michael Burley, an eminent academic historian, wrote an early work called Secular Power and Sacred Causes. But when he came in 2008 to write its more popular cousin, Blood and Rage, The Cultural History of Terrorism, the word sacred was dropped. And yet, wouldn't, would there be any rage or any blood if it were not for the sacred cause which terrorists pursue? Why was it dropped, that word? Well, that cause was not sacred to us, that is to the us likely to purchase the book, and who among that public is likely to know in any reliable way what the sacred is anyway. We'll take the title of another book in this field, John Esposito's Unholy War, Terror in the Name of Islam. Now that's a really excellent book, retracing exactly and coolly the rise in modern times of a politically radicalised fundamentalism within Islam. Esposito rightly wants us to distinguish what's holy and what's unholy. First of all, to rebuke the claims of Islamist fundamentalism to be fighting what Muslims very frequently call holy war. That expression is, of course, very much part of the history of Christendom. Also. Second, to refute one of the first Western interviews with Al-Qaeda leader Bin Laden, published in 1997, under the title Holy War Inc., that's to say incorporated, the critical take in that book being that <coughs> here is a basically modern, secular, Western-inspired movement with a few Islamic religious trappings. Esposito gets his objections to these ideas squarely right, I think, but even he misses the deepest level of explanation by failing to see any daylight, any illuminating contrast between the sacred and the holy. In all this, the sacred looks a bit like what physicists constantly refer to as dark matter. <laughs> Plenty of it about, but our instruments can't quite get hold of it. No more in the universe of minds made human beings than in the physical cosmos. We're only now beginning, I would say, to wake up to the sacred and to shed our reticence in facing up to all its implications. If, having been jerked awake by Islamist jihad, with its blood, its rage, and its sacred cause, we now fail to make the hard yards towards understanding this neglected category of things human, and fail to discern its deep laid connection to human violence, then our reconciliation tool is likely to be unfocused. It risks being a patchy practice of idealism at best, without the strong direction, consistency, and efficacy that theoretical understanding can bring. And at best, at worst, uh, it may be a blundering and talkative irrelevance. Reconciliation, sure, don't we all just love it? Indeed we do, but alas, sometimes in the mode of motherhood and apple pie. Whereas there isn't, as Bonner pointed out, this Coventry Cathedral standing side by side with its 
own blitz and blackened ruin has paid dearly enough to remember well. There isn't any cheap grace. So here's the plan. I suggest we start work today on that third term of my general title, Towards Reconciliation, Understanding Violence and the Sacred. <clears throat> Having got some sort of handle on what we most misunderstand and most leave out of account, namely the sacred, we can then work our way, stage by stage, towards understanding sacred or sacral or violence. That's what will help us know when, how, and even if we can move forward the underlying enterprise or mission of reconciliation. I'm often asked what I think of the sacred. I usually answer, I don't know what it is. I'm quoting Brian Williams, no less, speaking at an event I attended at the Cambridge University Festival of Ideas at the end of October, where this notion came up. And those are wise words. The sacred is protean, like electricity. It takes multiple forms, it produces the most diverse and bewilderingly contradictory discourses of explanation. And to boot, it generates, in our modern secular culture, a don't-go-there reaction of suspicion, irritated incomprehension and antipathy. Rowan doesn't know, you might say, what the hell can I hope to be saying? Good question. Well, I would like to try offering you a series of glimpses of the sacred in action. My ex-colleagues in academia, most of them who are philosophers at least, would no doubt have urged me to call this exercise a phenomenology of the sacred. What I will say is that it's a DIY version of that very fine and admirable thing, which is as much as I can manage. And I offer it here because it will speak more immediately to an English-speaking audience than the more Cartesian <coughs> and structuralist production we shall hear next week from René Girard. Don't get me wrong, Girard is the one with the real insight, as you will soon begin to see, but there's an introductory job of cultural translation and empirical recognition to be done first before we can benefit from his insights. With this brief prologue, let me simply jump in at the deep end. Recall, if you will, the episode in the Old Testament of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. Find it in Genesis chapter 22. The call or duty in the order of things sacred is seemingly laid upon the patriarch Abraham. He's called to sacrifice his son. Now, if we're at all anthropologically minded, we prick up our ears at this because that sacred duty allows us to identify the implicit context in time and space. It sends us back to the era of human blood sacrifice, especially of the bloody child sacrifice, a practice which Israel indeed encountered in the land of Canaan, an encounter distinction to which the religion of Israel is itself emerging and evolving. Look, for example, at Leviticus 18.21 and Deuteronomy 18.9-14, by standard version has a section heading child sacrifice, divination, <coughs> and magic prohibition. Call that is sacred binds both the victim and the human subject who is charged to do God's received or supposed will. Here, and this is the emerging Hebraic novelty, Abraham is the agent of the divine purpose through whom passes God's promise of blessing for all of humanity. In order to transmit that blessing, he must have a descendancy. He must have that long delayed and much expected son, the very one who, and this is the knot of the story, is apparently demanded of him a sacrificial victim. Here's an exquisite ambiguity and a baffling problem. On one hand, the sacred call is the imperative and all overriding voice of God. Sacred always means non negotiable. On the other, it signifies the appalling horror of the knife that kills. To decide, as Abraham does, to sacrifice his son is both costly offering of faith obedience and a cutting away of Israel's dearest and best hope of survival. More than mere survival, indeed, 
is the covenant promise itself, it is Israel's hope of salvation, and ours that is at stake. This act is, or it would be, had it come to pass, sacred violence. But sacred violence presented in this haunting story in its very sharpest and most problematic profile. How can God really desire the sacrificial killing of the bearer of the divine promise? That's the central paradox. Its result, albeit incompletely, in the story, God, it turns out, provides the proper scapegoat victim for sacrifice. The ram caught by its horns in the thicket. He had, so the text leads us to suppose, intended this outcome from the beginning. We glimpse here, obliquely, a remembrance of something else still, which is the modulation of the institution <coughs> itself of sacrifice. The passage from human sacrifice to animal sacrifice within the religion of Israel. And we see how that modulation allows Abraham to escape from the worst cutting edge, so to speak, of sacred violence. You may be aware that the English word scapegoat connotes etymologically an escape. <coughs> so here then, Abraham is unbound, let off the hook, so to speak, along with Isaac, and so is Israel. And all three become better bonded to God, as he is truly. That's how the story turns out in the telling. That's to say, in retrospective interpretation. Not only so, but uh, this story of the transcending human sacrifice marks, along with the historical rejection of the institution of human sacrifice, the acceptance of the absolute value of human beings as such. What is residually problematic of is the representation and image of God. What certainly remains unresolved is the gap between how we feel and perceive divine transcendence, and on the other hand, how God really is ultimately in himself. That indeterminate and potentially vast gap is here bridged by one little step in understanding, a tiny step taken empirically by trial and error. This world, it seems, is the place where the will of God is not known with certainty, not infallibly done, where it can be, and often will be, monstrously misconstrued and violently flouted. Hence, of course, in the Gospel, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, structurally, always, there is God's kingdom on earth. That's something which emerges, which comes to be. Genesis. <coughs> but have we not thereby recognised the gap of cognitive understanding and human uncertainty within which the sacred operates, and with, within which any number of human and cultural factors, themselves changing in time and space, have play and hold sway? We begin to see why the human sense of the sacred can and does change and change with protein variety in time and space, how it can even change valency, here from something morally positive, blood sacrifice and its primitive acceptance as God-given, good and due, to something morally negative. No, God does not desire sacrifice, not if by sacrifice is understood the bloody immolation of a child scapegoat victim. But then, if that is true, can we not just as well envisage the case in which this shift of moral perspective does not happen, or if it does, is obscured by a subsequent regression to a more primitive understanding? Witness Islamist fundamentalism. Witness ISIS. Muslims can, of course, reject ISIS. At most, thank God, do. But it is a mistake to pretend that IS isn't a religiously inspired millenarian group with a recognisable Islamic imprint. Anjem Chowdhury, London's most notorious defender of ISIS, says quite openly, crucifixions and beheadings are sacred requirements. Princeton-based academic specialist of medieval Islam, Bernard Heike, agrees, slavery, 
whose depictions and the headings are not something that freakish jihadists are cherry picking from medieval Islamic tradition. IS fighters are smack in the middle of the medieval tradition and are bringing it full circle into the present day. They are, I quote, authentic throwbacks to early Islam and are faithfully reproducing its norms of war. The Akedah is important to us all because it points to a parting of the ways in the religious development of humankind as such. One way leads to a critical, contextualized, <coughs> and emergent view of the religious source tradition. The other to an unmoving, unbending adherence to an absolutist sacrality. From that point on, most of us will wish to distinguish between the human sacred and the truly or intrinsically holy. That is a distinction of extreme significance, and it becomes entirely crucial, I suggest, when we are proposing to speak carefully rather than quickly or ill advisedly. About the involvement in human violence of religion. We can indeed perhaps sum up the argument thus far by saying that there are two doors, a marked swift exit from this topic. I hope we shall avoid taking either. One, if we're Muslims, will have written on it, IS is totally un-Islamic, it has nothing whatever to do with Islam. The other, if we're Jewish or Christian, is like unto it. Sacred violence is quite foreign to our religion. It has no part in our faith tradition or our history. An organized public cult. I think that's probably what most anthropologists these days would agree to mean by the word religion. <coughs> organized means that some specific content, some form of ritual procedure, and some significant mind shape has been imposed on something more spontaneous or immediate that went before, and out of which the organized cult has developed. If we had more uh, time on this important point, we should probably be able to see that the sacred is really the lining of the matrix, psychosocial matrix, from which originally emerged all of the 57,000 varieties of the human phenomenon we still call religion. And that would have gone some way to explain why it is still very much around in the modern world. It's sufficiently clear, at least, that the sacred is a proto-form of human spirituality, anticipating for long eons, no doubt, the organised cults we call religion. Its earliest expressions may have been very basic indeed, so basic that they may have amounted to little more than the most intuitional group intelligence that flickers invisibly between human beings, making us of one mind, binding us together, even as it binds us to and bonds us with an immediately felt mystery going beyond us, some transcendence. What binds and bonds us still today is the sacralities we share, if you doubt that, or fail to see what it means, try observing today the playing of national anthems at Rugby World Cup final, or at similarly big occasions and solemn gatherings. Look at those virile heroes of the 15-a-side, oval-shaped hall, lined up before the match, explicitly delegated to carry the torch for their nation, bearing witness before a massed audience of sports lovers in the stadium, worldwide to the deeper and older thing that lifts them <coughs> towards supreme <coughs> effort and glory. Watch the closed hand <coughs> held over the heart and see how the faces struggle to retain composure, deeply breathing, facial muscles frozen, eyes closed, lip quivering. Our heroes are close to tears, mouthing the words that many are unable to sing, invaded and taken over as they are by the God of sacred emotion. Or think of the dark charisma, fiercer and more brutal in feeling, of Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, as recorded for posterity in Newsweek and in Lenny Riefenstahl's film, The Triumph of the Will. 
That darker sacrality is distilled out of the tortured procession, the chants, the slogans, the hypnotic cadences of urgent and rasping speech, organizing the darkness, imprinting the ardent passivity of the listeners. This is an elaborately staged, ideologically orchestrated, pagan liturgy. Yes, the sacred varies in content and ethos. Here it's the will to power, incarnate in the Führer, and magnified in the feedback loop by his entranced and yielded audience. But it is in all of this the psychic or spiritual tissue of group understanding, complicity, intimacy. It's the most immediate experience of community, of communion, hence also of collective identity as such. It's the immediate and innermost electricity of us-ness, supercharged by a sense of transcendence. That's to say, of extra or super us-ness. In content and tenor, the sacred always was and still is ambiguous. Now a sort of benign white magic, and now positively demonic. It's decidedly black in the work of one modern atheistic thinker close to the Surrealist movement. Writing in the 1920s and 30s, Georges Bataille <coughs> accuses Christianity of catastrophically domesticating the sacred. It has drowned our sense of common spiritual tissue particularly has extinguished that primordial contact with life uh, by dousing it in a bland and benign therapy of white magic, thus opening the door to secularization. <coughs> by that, Batai understands the process of desacralization, evacuating that fearsome thrill of existing in a dangerous cosmos, insulating us from that primitive electric charge of the erotic life current pulsing in everything, thus opening the door to utilitarian values and to the pragmatic, down-to-earth, prosaic realisms of the century. Remember, the word secular is related to French siècle and Latin cycle. His idea is that our Western culture has thrown out the baby of the sacred with the bathwater, the bathwater being organized public religion and practiced for Bataille in most Frenchmen in the Catholic Church. <coughs> Bataille then explores the erotic thrill to be rediscovered in the transgression of religious commandments and civilized societies. His theme is sacred or sacral violence, which is always a violation of individual bodies and of moral norms. It involves a tearing apart of our being, laid open to the ever excessive charge of the cosmic life energies, at which point the paradigm of eroticism he is proposing coincides pretty nearly with sacrifice in its pre Christian and pagan conceptions. The paradigm of his human blood sacrifice, driven, as I think, by a sort of mystical but quasi sexual ecstasy breaking and entering, and the fusion with the life thrust in all its wild and savage energies of excess. George Bataille. On the other hand, at the other end of the ethos spectrum, we have Julien Cristeva, also a 20th century French atheist, albeit of a later generation, <coughs> in her case, the generation of post-1968 feminine and feminist atheists be it equally anxious to take back from religion a benefit or good supposedly purloined from humankind by religion. Or she says, this is French Enlightenment speak, monotheism. For Christeva, the post-Enlightenment humanist, the sacred is a form of para-religious white magic, though she does acknowledge the other blacker kind, as every psychotherapist I think must we are saying. Basically, it's some unexpected epiphany of meaning and value in an absurd world. She cites, believe it or not, the solemn majesty of British academic 
graduation ceremonies. But hey, there's a Coventry Cathedral, know what it is really, really doing on those days. She also cites the iconic female vulva dinner plate paintings by Julie Chicago. You can view that particular epiphany, if you care to, in the Brooklyn Museum in New York. Now, registering this diversity of glimpses of the sacred in action, we can perhaps agree provisionally that the sacred is indeed a sort of psychic excitement or electricity generated and registered within our deepest sensibility at those points where we enter into the most potent or live contact with external reality, including the nervous and psychic internet linking us intuitionally to other humans and that primordial contact with the cosmic life in all things. The imminent sense which we form within ourselves and carry ever with us is then available and open to management, even manipulation, socially. It dances like the aurora borealis around anything and everything that, as we say, turns us on. It's a charge, an aura, with which we invest anything and all things awesome. That was a mightily devalued piece of American speech. Awesome originally meant something. <laughs> Humankind, on this view, is the sacralizing animal. And in one sense, he's that before he is properly described as a <coughs> religious animal. Once invested in all events, human sacrality makes the object invested untouchable. Sacrosanct, as we say, a talisman promising some wider, perhaps ultimate communion or intimacy with the mystery of all things. And then we begin to see how a whole group of words organized around the human phenomenon of the sacred comes into play. Where the reverence <coughs> due to untouchable or sacrosanct things is defectively observed by others, whether from within our group or from Side. Wherever due reverence is actively refused or flouted, we experience desecration, sacrilege. Hence, we may think the dire extremity of violent punishment visited upon traitors and heretics in the 16th and 17th centuries. They had desecrated the king's majesty, they had defiled the sacred bond of sworn allegiance. Hence also the majesty of the church, of God's truth itself. This was a crime in the register of sacrilege, tantamount to, if not exactly identical with, blasphemy. There were no limits to the retribution visited on such offenders. It was terrible and exemplary. Hanging, drawing and quartering, torture, burning at the stake. Most of this performed publicly for the edification of all and we notice for the purging of group intelligence, the remaking of group identity in turbulent times amid ambiguous loyalty. From our last example, we can already see that this sacred principle of group cohesion, with its imperative force, capable of overriding all restraint, all relativization, with its fanatically mobilizing energy, and its hypnotic corridor of moral blindness will be there to be reckoned with when we seek to understand the devastating ferocity and destructiveness of human violence, when we come to take the measure of its perennity and omnipresence in human affairs, hence also of its potential for resurgence in the modern world. To unleash that ever latent potential, it will be enough to be persuaded that God is on our side, hence that we act in his name. In short, that our very violence is far from being inhibited, restrained, or even healed by the divine, is on the contrary, simply and solely sacred. We won't be able to get our heads around the notion of the sacred, I suspect, until we can take in, at a glance, that electric flicker, until we can see that eerie green light of the archaic sacred dancing over the Islamist court, to make it absolute in righteousness and unhesitating 
in its life until we recognize that playing around all the consequent violent acts, making them merciless and terrible, until we see it pervading the whole Islamist mindset, coursing through an entire worldview, uh, an entire political strategy, and tracing out those all too real shapes of almightiness and apocalypse and terror. It brings us appropriately enough to the second dimension of our subject human violence in its relation to the sacred. We are already aware obscurely of this link, aware as I have been busy suggesting, that it is what both fascinates and terrifies us in the significantly alerting case of ISIS. It isn't really that we haven't ever seen any previous avatars of this phenomenon of sexual violence and sacred terror before. In our own culture and civilization, not if we really think about it. But the dread of difference is all the more shocking to us now because it rises up in a blind spot of our thinking, in the gap between the expectations of a secularized yesterday and the half glimpsed possibilities of a suddenly fearsome tomorrow. By way of introducing this theme, I'd like to say something more about where we ourselves stand and about our modern violence-threatened and violence-haunted age. A slightly obsessional preoccupation, a fearful fascination with violence, is one of the defining characteristics of the bimillennium. And one symptom of this is the number of books that have appeared on this theme in the decade or so on either side of the year 2000 characterized briefly just a few of the most interesting keywords among them before presenting to you the thinker, the theology compatible and believing anthropologist from whom I borrow my title, <laughs> Violence and the Sacred, and who will be our principal guide in these lectures. We live in a residually traumatized age, still processing the memory of the recent world wars, Holocaust, exterminations, and genocides of the 20th century, reputedly the most violent century of all time. It's a problematic age of transition, too, still under the shadow of the nuclear holocaust that never quite came to be, but has also never quite gone away, and which imposes on us henceforth, for the first time in history, the burden of knowing that humanity has power to destroy our planet and put an end to the human adventure as such. We are the tiger, envisaged in scenarios of mutually assured destruction, eloquent acronym MAD, MAD. It's an anxious age, even now becoming conscious of other multiple forms of looming self-generating apocalypse. Climate change, the clash of civilization, a potential very possible Third World War between the haves and the have-nots. Pope Francis has invoked this possibility, developing out of scattered and at present low-level local conflicts not so far yet fused into one. Moreover, we realize uneasily that one form of apocalypse may not exclude the others, and that these end scenarios may be combining cumulus. You notice the number of films currently around which are variations on the common theme of apocalypse now. Such a time, multiply vexed and afflicted by unquiet thoughts about violence, stands in dire need of reassurance. Stephen Pinker, a Harvard psychologist and psychotherapist, sets out to provide it in an 800 page term entitled Robustly better angels of our nature, the decline in history of violence and its causes, 2011. This is a counterblast to nervous obsession and hysteria, and at that level it's intelligent, <coughs> useful, fully respectable. Good, for instance, at the Attenborough type, David Attenborough, I mean, the type mapping of the variety <coughs> of human violence, making a serious attempt to plot their distribution in time and space calculate their relative intensity, destructive force, 
and to retrace the apparent evolution overall of violence in human history. Pinker's book is significant in reminding us, for instance, that the age of the hunter-gatherers was more violently dangerous in terms of casualties and fatalities from violence, reckoned proportionately to total population, than is war-weary, murder-ridden, gun-toting modern America. It tells us that the century of the First and Second World Wars was, on the same basis of counting, <laughs> less terrible and less insecure than the time of Genghis Khan. True enough, most of us have simply no idea just how blood-soaked and terrified were the various yesterdays of our species. We lack all reliable perspective on all, all comparative framing of our own zits in labor. Pinker also offered a suggestive first stage of what changes things. Yes, the inventions of civilization, law and order, the state monopoly of violence, and rifles do tend to contain violence, just as there are also sources and models of its actual healing, its actual transformation into something else, hence the social advance driven by moral progress. But alas, Pinker offers nearly a third person, a cognitivist, a counter these things. It's not deeply illuminating. It's not an inside track story of insightful penetration. Basically, it's a commentary on 500 or so data sets, some splendid, some incomplete, insignificant, or downright misleading. These are presented in 500 or so graphs, crunching the statistics. They all retrace the same shape and tell the same story, which in point of interpretation Forms to, but is it also not publicly directed by an ideological narrative? All Pinker's interpretive numbers point in the end to the same model of positive exemplarity. All would be well, he claimed, if only all the violent people were more like extremely clever Western liberal intellectuals. Of impeccable enlightenment pedigrees. Living in the developed world and led by the better angels of our nature, like the good Harvard professor himself, perhaps. <coughs> Marginalizing all thoughts of the sacred and of the holy through aversion, Pinker may be said to herald another type of reaction to the problem of violence. And one that Christopher Hitchens for his part promotes into a proselytizing art form. He's following here a path opened up by new atheists, Richard Dawkins, the evolutionary Oxford biologist, author of The God Delusion, and American philosophers Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris. Hitchin's title is explanation enough of this second reaction. God is not great, how religion poisons everything. It's not clearly that Hitchens overlooks or ignores the role in the field of human violence of religious or archaic sacral motif. Quite the contrary, he makes a very full engagement with them, but purely and simply, this is the problem within the perspective of a defining identification which presents religion as the fountainhead of all evil. His book is an indictment, rehearsing, with some slight updating, a litany of accusation vision uh, forged by both fanaticism, exclusive zeal, dogmatic kind of certainty, authorizing all degradations and spawning cruelties, this devil's brew being laced with the poison of bad faith, self-righteousness, and merciless absolutism, and issuing then in sectarian rivalries, religious wars, persecution, torture, inquisition, and witch hunts. Well, we can see enough, well enough, what's bugging Hitchens and switching on his own sacral supercharged combativity. The invisible thorn is right there in the amalgam which is, which is practiced in this type of, let's say, the conflation by sleight of hand of 
different and separate things. God is not great. We recognise this Hanuk slogan, Allah Akbar, turned on its head. More than that, and more intimately to the dynamical and polemical indictment, this book returns to centre the defiant die in your rage, not politically radicalised and violent <coughs> Islamic fundamentalism. Hitchens' book functions, in fact, this is of course what can be declared, by turning an already deviant and extreme or extremist image of Islam into the very paradigm of all religion, of religion as such. <coughs> Imagine the impact of this message in the home of Adam Mark. You remember the scene in that all-American CIA reality thriller where anti-hero Brody rises in the dead of night to purify himself and begin secret Islamic devotions in his suburban American garage. Allahu Akbar! What could send a deeper shudder, a sacred horror to the middle of the night? Hitchens does this is better to écraser la femme, Voltaire's expression meaning to crush the infamous and unnameable thing that is perceived to be crawling out of the darkness. He cooks to sell his book. I'm not, I hope no one is in the business of forgetting or underestimating those 16th and 17th century horrors of European history. But how can we truly explain, genuinely face, really acknowledge and actually neutralize them. Who will give us an adequate account of their psychosocial genesis and function? An account distinguishing in full daylight and to all see between the perverse throwback of religious variety on the one hand and what we call orthodox or mainline religion on the other. Who will elucidate the interface between the archaic sacrifice survives and sometimes erupts catastrophically in all of us and this something else we want to call our religion. An anecdote to give due weight to these questions. In 2007 I found myself in California where Christopher Hitchens, having at that time just acquired American nationality, was making his promotional tour for Justice Book. Caught up with him in the main bookshop of cool and affluent Menlo Park, California. No tele evangelists there. They were, they were only admiring and youthful New Agers sprinkled with grey hair, Democrat leaning intellectuals. Christopher Hitchens made his pitch, predictably acerbic and crowd pleasing, after which I asked him if he would take a question from an ex compatriot. I said, you know that a few miles south of here at Stanford University, there is a French professor who recognises very fully all the forms of poison we associate with and identify as religion. However, he doesn't call it by that name, but by another, which is the archaic sacred. He thinks that the antidote, the answer in therapy, hence the analysis you need and want, lies in, well, as a matter of fact, the Christian Gospels themselves, which seem to be, by the by, most strangely exiled on their own account of religion. I explained that Planitiar sees a regression, which is the latent and possible reaction in all humans, especially in objects of stress, triggering fundamentalist transposition by means of appropriations, travesties of mainstream religion. Uh, in the name of God. In this powerful and timely book, Jonathan Sachs explores the roots of violence, focusing on the historic tension between the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now this is a, a fine book, as welcome as it is timely, but time presses, and so uh, perhaps saving up for future lectures some of the riches of Sachs's book, uh, let's come directly to Panagia, here at last. He died aged 91 just before Christmas at the beginning of November, passing away peacefully 
at his home just off the campus at Stanford University, California. May I introduce him to those of you who know little or nothing of him? That's very easily done by quoting from tributes appearing in the French Catholic daily La Croix. Please don't worry if all is not immediately transparent to you. I'm simply at this stage wanting to establish the pertinence of Girard for our title theme. I quote, all of what follows is in quotation marks. René Girard, violence unmasked. René Girard, decipherer of the sacred. He devoted his work to the analysis of human rivalry and violence and saw in Christianity the transcending of these things, the way beyond them. Girard identifies the place where the sacred emerges in the practice of sacrifice, in that form of sacrifice in which the scapegoat is sacralized, divinized. He, the scapegoat, will henceforth carry the vocation of preserving the reconciled community. Sacrificial ritual, allowing humankind to reactivate the social bond. And myth, permitting us to preserve the memory of it. You see, violence, sacred, and even towards reconciliation. What might all that imply? I quote again, this violence and this sacred are, for Venetia, the origin of culture. Humanity is born out of the religious dimension of things. Humanité est fille du religieux. That's why René Girard says we live in sacrificial societies. We live in sacrificial societies, which means, among other things, we are always convinced the other is guilty. One day, the new, unheard of world arrives with Christianity, telling us that victims are not guilty. This revelation deconstructs all cultures. How are we to see René Girard's achievement and significance? Quote, he built an intellectual infrastructure, a platform of intelligent thinking, which is indispensable for any non-violent enterprise. He reintroduces the Old and New Testaments into the bloodstream of secular thinking. He quoted Simon Weil, the French Jewish mystic. The Gospels, before becoming a theology, that is to say, a science of God, are anthropology, which is to say, a science of man. This was a generous and warm-hearted man of profoundly holy intelligence. I will try to elucidate and amplify that very bare outline in lectures to come. The second lecture will take us through mimetic theory, in which is embedded René Girard's understanding of violence and the sacred. The third will engage with his writings on the Old and New Testaments. The fourth will move from passion and resurrection to reconciliation. But already, we have, do we not, something of a vantage point. We've seen how a mysterious and ill-understood notion of the sacred might be some sort of pointer to the origin and nature of violence and to the moral ambiguity of human nature, whether anthropologically or theologically deciphered. We can begin to see, at least in principle, how the sacred might provide Hitchens with an understanding of his poison and Sachs with a formula for his elusive common ground between the Abrahamic Face. Two quick GPS location readings, both designed to retrace and to verify this vantage point we have reached today, and then I'll stop. Both come in the form of myths, one ancient, one modern. GPS check number one. <coughs> the common frame of understanding of violence common at least for the Abrahamic <coughs> and acceptable also to others, accessible anyway to others, is provided in the Bible by the story of creation, temptation and fall, given in the opening chapters of Genesis, that profound and seminal account of shadow upon splendour. Splendour, as French philosopher Paul Ricoeur has brilliantly shown in his Pensée la Bible, Thinking the Bible, 
re-echoing exultantly out of the deepest ontological sensibility of the human creature in contact with the world. Order from chaos, the provision of all things needful in the garden of delights, the joys of language, the otherness of gender, of human fellowship, sexuality, language, that is, ontologically speaking, the first dimension within which the animal become human is upon psychic awakening addressed by the Creator. And that joyous electricity of praise leaps from summit to summit within a bonded Eden. But that bonded sphere of communion with the world and its Creator admits of a secret presence and a lining of dark otherness, a black sacrality. If not ultimate, this insinuating presence is at least ancient, intimate, and fascinating. And it is animal in nature. Today, we should say it is continuous with man's own animal antecedents in evolutionary time. And that other dark, the sacral voice, insinuates what? The urge to rival with the creator, so as to realize an autonomous and self-sacralizing divinity. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Exactly so. That godlike shot or thrill, that ersatz transcendence, is the definition of what jihad understands <coughs> by the sacred. Gods, that plural, stands surely in memory of the polytheism Israel too has known. And yet, the text gives us as gods in recognition of the delusory or mirific character of the godlikeness thus realized and its status as caricatural inversion of the reality it would imitate. At once, that darker principle is seen to be expressed in violence, with the murder of Abel by the other son of the first couple, Cain. Human violence spreads a corrupting disorder. It contaminates civilization. It infects nature. The darkly self sacralizing animal is the super violent animal. Enough to make God all but repent of his creation. The tribal God of Israel is still, for the moment, the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle, very much a God on our side. Look again at the narratives of the conquest of the promised land and at the internecine struggles of Israel's sacral kings. They contain tales of divinely inspired ethnic cleansing, revenge and massacre, with distinct prefigurations of ISIL. Narratives, all of them, of the Iron Age, which, by the by, coincides pretty much exactly with the creative but very violent period that runs from Israel's beginnings, as traced in the Hebrew Bible, through to the rise of Islam something like 1500 BC to 700 AD. The covenant and the law provide the necessary bonding and binding. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. One hopes that anthropology and theology, secularist and believer, and all Abrahamic theologians among themselves might agree to agree after negotiation, each party in their own way, about that common framing of the problem which we have to face <laughs> in common. GPS location fix number two comes in the form of a modern parable brilliantly developed in the book and then the film, The Life of Pi. You probably know the story, an Indian boy forced to emigrate with his family from their native land is shipwrecked in a violent storm in mid-Pacific on the way to Canada. He takes to a lifeboat in company with a variety of animals escaped from a zoo, which the traversing and shipwrecked freighter had been carrying in its hold, <coughs> including a magnificent and fearsome Bengal tiger kind of guess the tiger might be putting in a return appearance. A splendid and terrible adventure of survival on the great ocean of life ensues in the perilous company of this magnificent beast. At one point, the survivors' lives are saved by a sojourn on a floating island of vegetation composed of mango tree roots. 
It's inhabited by a whole maroon population of bright, inquisitive, little meerkat-like creatures dashing about everywhere, chattering interminably, and threatening to outpopulate their exiguous living space. Rather, one feels like humanity on our teeming and ever more globalized, and I probably mean westernized, little planet. I wouldn't be totally astonished to learn that these very intelligent, interchangeable, and anxious little creatures were really called pinkers. <laughs> the meerkats, of course, pay their tribute to the predation of the tiger, and they crowd anxiously round strange sinkholes in the vegetation, which appear to communicate way down below the floating tangle of twisted roots with the great ocean depths. The Indian boy swims with delight in the daylight transparency of these pools, reflecting only the sky. But at night, these same pools become fearsome, secreting an unknown acid or poison, which is discovered to have dissolved entirely the corpse of a previously shipwrecked survivor. So that the boy must take again to his tiger-carrying lifeboat and <coughs> drift on east to west. We're not told what the right interpretation is. This is a reflexive postmodern parable, respectful of non-closure and multicultural plurality. The hermeneutics are explicitly left to the <coughs> film's writer figure, who is tasked with establishing the published version of the story, and who, of course, represents ourselves, hearers of the parable. But we can see that the parable reflects in mythic wise and that it reflects upon our fast globalizing multicultural world and the fundamental enigma of those sinkholes which communicate with our own depths in evolutionary time and which engage our own survival in a world of splendor, a world, however, that is haunted and overshadowed by violence, cosmic, animal, and human. That's where we are at the end of this first lecture, and it's pretty much where we all are in the wider scheme of things. Join me next Tuesday, if you will, for some more sinkhole diving <coughs> as we try to unravel further, but now with help from René Girard, those tangled roots of the enigma of violence and the sacred. Thank you. Thank you.